I want to start with a question. Um, and I, I wrote this on the train on the way down. I was sitting next to Jenny, a grandma who was crocheting, and we got we, we swapped some, um, some notes on knitting and crocheting. And she talked about her grandchildren, and she talked about um, resilience, and she talked about catching and storing water, and she talked about growing food. And we shared our um, experiences. But before we got talking, and uh, Jenny was quite a talker, and uh, I had to practice t uh, my listening, which um, needs a lot of practice. Um, I wrote this down as maybe a beginning for today, and I think it, it, um, it might uh, help to kick things off. Is it time to return to the living of things, to attend to our des domestication and sense again what we once understood about more than human life and semiotics. The speakings of wild apple trees, the songs of cicadas and creeks, the signs and manifestations of slime mold, and the espionage of mycelium. This is our common sense, entirely lost, or nearly entirely lost, to religious dogmas, selfish genes, and other Darwinian ideologies, including capital. In the reanimating of the worlds of the world, we will again inhabit calendula time, be intoxicated by gum leaf, pushed around by promiscuous wings, caught by a thick flood of wrens, and licked by the giving and getting love of dog. And so that's where I really want to start my little storytelling is um, my uh, uh, understanding of uh, more than human consciousness and um, the consciousness of animals began uh, as a child growing up in a house of dogs. There were always dogs, sometimes some cats. Uh, there were other more domesticated animals uh, out further in the, in the paddock. But dogs, um, for me, is my, what I understand from an adult perspective, was my way back into the living of the, what I call the living of the world. And dogs are this really interesting point, um, and Deborah Bird Rose speaks about this so eloquently through her Aboriginal teachers in her amazing book called Wild Dog Dreaming. Um, about how dogs and humans share uh, a common cosmology. And in many Aboriginal cosmologies, dogs and human dreamings are the same thing. And we also see this in many other cultures with the, with the jaguar, and we see it with the werewolf, and the person, wolf, person, dog, person, dingo, um, relationship is very old and um, and very sacred. So I grew up with little dogs, um, and they were always about. And I didn't really have to learn dog culture. Um, I, I feel like as a child growing up, the kinship relationships were just explicit. It wasn't academic, um, and I now I'm out present how the present dog of, of, of my life is, is a little dog called Zero. He's eight years old. He's a Jack Russell. And he has taught me uh, many, many things um, over the last eight years. Uh, he's the elder of the household by dog years. And, but he's also made me reflect on the little dogs that I grew up with, Bella and Sally and Eleanor. And, and it wasn't until I moved out of house, out of home, and uh, moved in with a, a girlfriend who had an enormous dog, uh, uh, a dog that was a Rottweiler <laughs> called Gustav, that I actually understood that actually the relationships between dogs and humans uh, some, sometimes have to be negotiated and sometimes uh, in, in a critical way. Uh, 
at a critical time. And so my, my girlfriend was off working at the time. We'd just moved into this little shack in, in country New South Wales. And it was freezing cold. And I was in the house by myself, lying on the ground, maybe reading a book, I can't remember. And all of a sudden, Gustav stood over me and puffed his chest out and didn't growl, but looked at me and basically said, where do you fit in? Where do I fit in to this arrangement? Um, Gustav and, uh, and my girlfriend at the time were a, a king, were, were close uh, in relationship. I was the newcomer. And his presence and his muscularness and his threateningness uh, caused me to do something I'm not very proud of, and that is to slowly get up and raise my arm to his jaw, because I prefer my arm to have got ripped apart than my neck, um, and slowly just moved above him and used my bipedal humanness to then scream at him in, in horror and fear and kick him out the door and screaming at him. And that was my way of asserting uh, my dominance in his pack. And so this was a, a knee-jerk knee reaction, uh, a reaction of fear. But I hadn't learnt the proper uh, education. Uh, I hadn't understood um, the necessity to work out our place with Gustav, and, um, and so that was my first uh, big learning, and I'd forgotten about that story until preparing for this talk, um, uh, I started to read Eduardo Conn's How Forests Think, where he talks about uh, going off with a hunting party in the upper Amazon, and how the hunters say to Eduardo, the anthropologist, um, always sleep on your back because uh, they're sleeping out rough with a small lean-to over them. When the jaguar comes at night and stands over you and looks up into your eyes, you will look back and you, in his or her eyes, will be represented. And that animals represent us as much as we represent animals. And that was such a... It, it, that just immediately put chills through through my, through my body, and I re immediately re remembered my uh, rather pathetic response to Gustav. But nonetheless, a very important learning. Um, and so out of that story, uh, Eduardo Conn um, begins his research as an anthropologist into how to, to produce uh, an anthropology that is post-human, that is more than human. Um, and I think that the story of understanding, um, I, I'll just step back a, a moment. My grandmother is a big part of this story too. Um, she is part of my grandma, grandma university education that um, Vandana Shiva uh, talks about. And she was the, the elder in my life who told me as a young boy, always let a dog lick your wounds, always let a dog uh, lick your cuts. And as a young country kid growing up in the 70s, I had lots and lots of cuts on my legs. And I would notice the household dogs were always willing there to, to lick them. And when she said let, that is the, the key word because in the 100,000 years of evolution with dogs that humans have had, we have close, we have domesticated dogs as, as dogs have domesticated us. And one of the, the gifts that dogs give, give to us um, is their incredible tongue microbiome and the incredible healing property of, uh, of dog tongue or dog lick microbes. So much so that vet friends of mine have, t have told me that now dog lick serum is an actual thing to use on horse cuts and, um, and, and other mammals. Um, so dogs' mouths are off the scale, but all we humans have a microbiome of, of, that, is, that is killing pathogens and uh, viruses and things all the time. Our licks, when we, when we cut ourselves and we go to, um, to hold the blood in our mouth, is not just a, 
condemn the, the blood, but actually to start healing. And so my grandmother, to take it back to my grandmother and her uh, wisdom, um, in the, the kinship of dogs is, again, another place. And I think we all probably have these stories, but for me is a place of reconnection with the animate world. And I think dogs offer us, in our, in our highly domesticated spheres, uh, dogs, for me, enable us to, to re-perform um, relationships with not just animals, but, of course, mushrooms and plants and rocks and life uh, and the, the consciousness, or what um, Rupert Sheldrake calls morphic resonance, the, the holding of memory in a crystal so that the crystal knows how to re-perform or to, re, um, to, to make itself after its initial memory. When, when we start to think about um, more than human um, consciousness, I think we, we have the opportunity to understand that it is not just our life that we uh, have in the balance in terms of climate change, in terms of ecological uh, destruction, and in terms of social injustice, but it's the lives of uh, more than humans um, that are, are deeply affected by our lack of relationship with the with the more with the with the living of the world. So um, I'd like to <laughs> to pass to to Claire. Thank you. Hi everyone. I feel um, really grateful to um, be here in the afternoon when the sun's come out and the winds died down, and I feel very grateful to be sandwiched between these two wonderful humans, colleagues, and friends who um, who walk the talk in a very, very real way, and I'm very inspired by how they live and what they do. And I'm the only one that's still left in the city, so I've got a bit of a different take on, on this in some ways. Um, animism respoken. So I'd like to start, I'd like to share a couple of stories um, initially, and then some reflections on this theme. And uh, my two stories are, um, are from the feathered kingdom, the winged ones. And the first story is from this morning, actually. I woke up at first light, as I usually do, and there's always that choice point, isn't there? Um, okay, I'm up. Do I stay inside and do all sorts of inside things, including turning my phone on or checking the weather rather than just going outside to see the weather or making cups of tea and catching up on work, meditating, yoga? Or do I go outside? And more often than not, I choose outside, even if there's some resistance to the weather or to things I have to do. And so this morning, I, I had some resistance because I thought I should prepare. I hadn't any idea what I was going to talk about. And I thought, I need to write some notes. And it's like, no, the river is calling me. So I went down and I got my, my new toy, my paddleboard, and I put it in the river. And I started paddling upstream. And you know, there's the sun, the sun's just, hasn't not sunrise, but the light's just you know, pink in the sky. And I'm heading east, upstream, and no one else on the river, which is lucky because I've got my pyjamas on. And uh, this, this little instinct said, look up and to the left. And I looked up into a tree I don't usually look into because it's not one of the glorious river red gums that I'm always admiring. It was an elm, a re really large elm tree. And I looked up and kind of caught in my eye this black blob that did not look like an elm leaf or a branch and kind of pattern recognition, okay, bird, I'm going closer. And what I discovered was um, three powerful owls, which is Australia's largest forest owl, um, in this elm tree, which was, um, you know, I've gone past how many times and I've been messaging the, the Facebook birders group, what, what owls are around my area in this season, you know, and, and here they are, these incredible, like just awe-inspiring um, owls. And there was a couple of juveniles um, and they were making, one of them was making, a, I think it was kind of an a, a, a alarm noise, like a zzzz, it's a noise, a, a sound I've never heard the powerful owls make. So I docked and climbed up on the bank and into someone's backyard and um, spent some time with these owls this morning. And um, one of them locked their eyes we locked eyes and it started doing this cool little neck thing. And so I started doing the cool little neck thing back. 
And then its face, you know, it had that kind of classic frown, but its face kind of morphed and it, it took me back to a photograph of myself in preschool. Just for seconds, I, that, that, that image of myself as a preschooler came back to me and then it was, then it was the owl again. And then the owl kind of, you know, got a bit sick of me, went, oh, I'm going back to sleep. And so off I went up the river. But um, that, uh, that interaction we had um, was multi-layered for me because I have had strong experiences with that powerful, with, with powerful owls before. And so I was, I felt very, you know, I greeted it out loud. I said, greetings, wild one. And then kind of listened, you know, in a, in a kind of whole body listening, not in a kind of like, is it going to say something in words to me, but just like a feeling sense, you know, what, what's the story with this owl? What's the, what's the kind of, what's the communication that we might be able to share this morning? And for whatever reason, that photo of myself as a child and then some emotion around that photo of me and, and how I felt at that time in my life came up. And that was the gift from um, the powerful owls this morning. So that's story number one. And story number two is not my story. It's a story of a friend of mine last week. And um, she had had a, a kind of a waking dream, like a, a vision that um, a kookaburra was came, came and perched on a branch. She was going through a really, really hard time and, and facing some hard decisions. And in this kind of vision that she had, a kookaburra was, was kind of her ally came and perched on a branch and was just this kind of still, um, supportive sense. And last week she went for a walk down by the Yarra near where I live and she was quite upset and she sat down in a, in a quiet private spot and was shedding some tears and a kookaburra came down and landed on the branch directly in front of her and looked at her and then turned and bit a feather from its wing and dropped it in front of her. Now, of course, you could say, well, that's a wonderful coincidence. Um, who knows? But for my friend, it was a very significant um, experience, interaction, uh, relationship. And she came away from that having, um, you know, certainly a greater sense of clarity around her decision, but a deep sense of trust, um, that there is a much wilder, wider uh, world going on at, at play. And this was, you know, in the suburbs, in the suburbs of um, the inner north. So the linking theme for me with those two stories is uh, a sense of being enchanted or re-enchanted with the wild world. And that this kind of enchantment or this kind of like sense of encountering the world with deep imagination, with a radical kind of openness and receptivity um, is for me uh, such a key piece in the, the seeds of recreating, re-establishing a vibrant relationship with the other than human. Um, and, the, you know, these are tasks if we were growing up in a, in a you know, wild world, you know, in a village culture in which these experiences were commonplace, um, these, this, this would be our birthright. This would be, you know, tasks of a normal childhood would be to establish an understanding of the animate world and a relationship with all sorts of um, creatures, plants, animals. Um, so these, these tasks of, of early childhood, like vital developmental tasks, most of us skipped over. Most of us didn't have that, that modelling um, through teachers or parents or, our, you know, our culture. So, you know, Patrick kind of talked about the dogs being his doorway back into that relationship with the world. And so that's part of what I see and what I, what certainly what, what I've been working towards and exploring in the last kind of 20 years is reclaiming that relationship, reclaiming that um, that kind of deep imaginal space in which these relationships, these interactions, these communications are part of my experience of the world. They're not just numinous experiences for a vision quest on the mountain, but they're, um, they, they're such a rich part of my life. And it's part of this kind of 
you know, this movement of rewilding, which is a term um, that I use because it's such a great word, um, because it's so evocative. Like, I really see how it, it, it evokes or catalyzes this, like, ah, oh, yes, there's something in that. There's this rewilding. We were once wild. Wild in terms of that re-enchantment, that enchantment, that encountering the world with innocence, with awe, with wonder, um, with radical openness. Um, and rewilding is kind of that invitation back into that relationship through all sorts of different practices, um, which we can talk about. But it's overall, it's that sense of coming back to a, a deeply connective um, way of being in the world. And of course, in the city, the human dominated landscape is not conducive to that. Um, most of our social, our interactions, our communications, our relationships are all human. What is mirrored back to us is human created landscapes and, and forms. And it doesn't lend itself so easily to just this natural extension of our community sense to the more than human landscape. So um, unlike these two lucky ones, I do live in the city, um, about five and a half kilometres upstream from here. And so I have to make a really, um, a really strong and conscious effort and decision to put myself in landscapes that are not human dominated, um, to really know that the wild, wild is available to us everywhere if we have the ears to hear it, the eyes to see it, the senses to really notice it, like the clouds passing over us right now. Um, and there's, there's ways that I, that I make sure I plug into this because it is, the, the field of the city is so antagonistic to this way of being that it's so easy to forget, you know, and there's this rewilding is like remembering. Um, it's, it's, it's remembering and it's a practice and so some of the practices I use to, to kind of plug back in and to, you know, kind of keep that current going, keep that connective state going is my sit spot, a, a place that I sit. Um, it's actually in my backyard, but for some people, for some friends of mine, it's in their local park. But one place that I sit regularly, a few times a week at least, but often daily, and it's the same spot, which is the key the same spot that I go back to and observe the changes and build the relationships and get to know the, the flowering of the plants around me and the cycles of the edible weeds. And of course, it leads to some tracking and some foraging and some bird watching and some paddleboard. Like it, it leads to other things, but it's like the anchor point. It's the anchor point that grounds me in that kind of daily rhythm of the more than human world. And other practices that support that for me are um, foraging, like foraging both from my cultivated garden but also wild foraging, um, developing relationships with trees in, in my kind of, you know, like animals have a kind of a range. You know, I've just been looking up how, how big the, the range of my foxes are in my backyard. It's quite large. But, like, I, I kind of feel like I have a range as well in terms of, like, how, how far I can develop intimate relationships with, um, you know, with the, the wider backyard. So I kind of get to know, OK, there's, well in a permaculture terms, it might be the post zone five, like the trees, the plants that are going to be friends, allies, edibles, medicinals, um, inspirations. Um. And the other practice that I think Maya is going to talk about a little bit more is, um, is dance, because that doesn't require me to be in the forest. And it puts me very much in my wild senses. It takes me out of my mind and into a full-bodied, present-centered um, relationship. And it feels like the, the state of consciousness that it takes me to, which is dancing in terms of free-form dancing, um, is similar state of consciousness to when I've been you know, immersed in the forest for hours or days. So my doorway into a, a deeply connective state was when I lived in the forest for a year, practicing all the, the earth skills, the traditional crafts, um, building my own shelter and lighting fires with, you know, rubbing sticks together, fire by friction, and really, really immersing myself without my phone, without much social interaction, 
Um, and my practice was, was mostly just wandering without time or destination, which is just such a wonderful way to um, sink into that, that earth time. And I was so lucky to have that year because it established this kind of very strong foundation of relationships with the more than human world. And from that, I've been able to, sus to sustain living in the city and, and know that it's available. It is available anywhere. And that there, we're lucky enough in Melbourne that there is so much green space that we can be immersed and walk for, you know, for a while without actually um, feeling like we're being overwhelmed by human-dominated landscape. So there's lots more I could say, but I feel like I'd, I'd like to pass on to Maya. She might pick up some of the threads that I'm, I'm leaving off. And um, we welcome so some questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire, Patrick. Really, again, lovely to be here with you, fellow cultural creatives seeking to make a different type of culture with our intentions and our practices to um, bring something latent in us all into cultural form and that is our our wildness a real reclaiming of our full bodied experience our full earthed experience lovely to be here 20 years of um, SLF congratulations to everyone involved so many threads I'd love to pick up on. Just briefly, I want to share my powerful owl story that happened when I was living also on the Yarra, uh, a little upstream from Clare, but not where I am now. And I was wandering through the forest near the water's edge, came out from sort of between two tree branches, and bang, we were a metre apart. It was about just above me, so it was like this. And I was held completely caught by that predator gaze. It's a moment that is utterly indelible to have felt that hunter being stare straight into me, fearless and clear and strong, and understanding that that gaze has been an ongoing shaping thing in our being for millions of years of evolution as us primates encountered the world, encountered the wildness around us and learnt about being hunted and learnt about hunting. There's something very, very shaping and very rearranging in an encounter that raw. So thank you for your story, Claire. It really brought that alive to me again. It's an interesting time in my life. 16 years ago, almost, I walked the length of the Yarra. I started in Williamstown, and I headed up, I passed this way, and I kept going day after day after day, camping along the way. The first night camping at Herring Island, the second night calling the children's farm, on and on and on until we got to the Great Dividing Range, the tiny, clear, little, crystal clear creeks of delicious water, a small little hollow in the sphagnum moss in the mountains. That experience completely rearranged me. It was a very, very strange initiation. Something happened in that experience that took me so long to unravel. When we left, we had the great gift of a Wurundjeri woman, Tammy Kapoki, coming down and asking that the spirits of the ancestors walk with us. We walked a path 40, 50, 60,000 years old, a cultural way. We walked in 2003, in 1903, William Barrack, the last traditional headman of the Wurundjeri died just 100 years in 50,000 years of cultural history, of a way of knowing a deeply animate way. That small experience, the 22 days of that journey, was enough to give me a tiny little glimpse 
into a completely different way of constituting the self. The self was not the human. The self was continuous. I remember, and it brings me to tears now actually, the body memory of lying in the sphagnum moss and looking up and seeing the rain and knowing the winds come from the west and the waters are picked up in the ocean, they're picked up in the bay and they travel, they travel all the way to the mountains and there the rivers run down again. I felt that cycle of the bay where I used to, I live, I grew up in the bay, I swam in the bay. I felt that connection, our bodies, are 70% water. If we're Melburnians, 70% of our body is river water mostly. Yarra River water. We are more river than any other thing. You could think of us as a piece of river with hands and tongues speaking about the self. That's not such a strange thing to say. Most cultures in the world until very, very recently understood that as part of their being. The, the Western mindset, the industrial capitalist system of, of life that has sort of overtaken the world is a certain way of thinking that is, is only it's only just emerged, and it can't and won't last long. And we will, all of us, return back into a very different and very whole way of being. And I think that is part of what really sustains me in this work, is knowing something very different, and knowing how full and whole that is. I was at the Great Debate last night, and. Helena Norberg Hodge, who spent time in Ladakh pre-modernization, so no roads, cars, phones, outside technologies, fossil fuels, where people lived full, utterly sustainable lives and were brimming with happiness, very deep in the system of their plants, their animals, their mountains. And she watched as that broke as outside influence came so quickly and with such a rupture that the psyche couldn't hold and the culture in so many ways collapsed. She glimpsed that wholeness there. Anyway, John Thwaites, the former environment minister, was sort of talking and he was like, yes, the importance of development. And you could see that he had never had an experience like Helena. It's a different way of knowing. She had had that immersion in a type of wholeness. And yes, many people who have never glimpsed this think it's romantic. It's not. It's not. It is our birthright. It is our innate wildness. It is a type of wholeness and a way of being. And there are many, many doorways for that. And that is what rewilding is, and that is the work that I think we're all seeking to get involved in. I, um, when I walked the Yarra, and I got to the end, and I felt a sense of ancestors, so completely and, and fully, I didn't know what to do with that knowing. And for months afterwards, I was shaking every time I spoke about it. For years, I tried to work out how could I, a white person, feel like I was inside a song line? How could I have a sense of, of hearing something like a gentle singing just outside the edge of my hearing for the entire 22 days of walking. How could that be? What right have I got for that? What 
What wrong am I doing by even having this feeling? This is the sort of problem that we, as bearers of the legacy of invasion and colonisation, need to investigate. It's not an easy thing. I spent 16 years, 16 years ago, I feel like I'm just starting to really understand and be able to own and claim that experience as an innate part of the wildness that we all have and that we all need to own and reclaim. I'm very interested in my work in demystifying mysticism. It was a profound spiritual experience to walk the Yarra. It utterly destabilised me. And part of the problem was I didn't understand spiritual experience because I had no initiation into it. I, this, it's very complex and I can't say much about it. So it's, I'm almost wary of going into it. But what can I say that is useful? We've had a a few millennia of disembodied spirituality. God is out there and up there and away. But things can really change now because we are finally getting a science that is catching up with the reality of what we are. Very interesting piece of information of the million bits of information that come to this body. 13 of those are processed in the conscious mind. That is 0.0013% is processed here. The rest comes to the body. What does that mean? When we use our brain differently, when we walk, when we are immersed in a body experience that goes on and on and on and we're close to nature and we're in it and we're in it and we're in a trance, something happens, parts of the very small amount of information, the, the cognitive mind changes. Its dominance changes and we can hear what happens in the body. More of what we are comes to consciousness. That is not exactly wordless, which is why poetry works to pierce and help you know what you are. That's why writing can be a rewilding experience because, and this is also completely fascinating, the information they've got about channeling and mediumship, like what, what that is, or even an experienced creative writer, the language centre of the brain turns off. And I've experienced that. I sit down at my computer, I can touch tight, close my eyes, sitting half lotus on my chair, stock still for hours because I'm in bliss, but I'm writing and it's not coming from what I think of as me. But it is coming from the body which is spirit. And the body is not this body, the body is continuous, the body is breath. Without breath I am dead, the breath is absolutely body. This, all of this here is body. It is your body. The water is our body. Our food is our body. This is an experience that can be known and held through dance, through embodiment, through these rewilding work. And I might have gone on too long, so I should stop now. But let's keep talking. Um, and we're going to have a conversation now. I'm not sure how much time we've got left. And after, we'd like to invite any of you who are interested. We're going to go down on the grass and do some movement work that may help um, give a little taste of some of this work that we're seeking to share. Thank you.